Well, we thank you folks for joining us once again, and welcome to Grace. In our previous lesson, um, we concluded our look at letter number six from the Apostle Paul, and as most of you will recall, that was the book of Romans, so we've taken quite a time to go through Romans, and uh, we know that Paul wrote that letter to the church at Rome from Corinth while he was on his third apostolic journey. Some people say mission makes no difference to me. When that journey was complete, Paul returned with a financial offering, a financial gift from the believers in Achaia and Macedonia. To the left, if you're watching this uh, message, uh, he had come from Thessalonica. He's now down to Corinth, and he's writing the letter to Roman, to the Romans assembly. And he's got a gift from the people in that area, Greece and uh, Macedonia, uh, for the poor Jewish saints in Jerusalem, the Jewish capital city uh, at that time, and uh, still is, and... Uh, and of course, we know that that's where the Jews that were members of that earthly kingdom promise were located. Uh, but before reaching Jerusalem, Paul stopped in Caesarea. So if you follow the blue line back, you'll see the arrow toward the bottom. And then on down from that arrow is Jerusalem. But uh, that first arrow, when he gets back to the mainland there, we would, might call it, is Caesarea. And why the need for this financial contribution? I think some of you have an idea what that need might be. Um, well, the believing Jews at Jerusalem had been under tremendous persecution. I think it was more the persecution than selling out earlier on, as uh, we're often taught. Uh, they were under tremendous persecution by the non-believing Jews who had, uh, had scorned any notion of Christ being Israel's Messiah, much less that, he'd, that he was alive, that he'd risen from the dead. So naturally, these antagonistic Jews sought to punish any of their countrymen, as Paul called them, any of their countrymen who believed or taught uh, what they silently rejected. So now the Apostle Paul was heading right into what he knew would be, um, we might call it persecution central or uh, the hornet's nest, so to speak, with this contribution in hand for these persecuted Jews who had uh, most likely been shunned when it came time to finding employment. If you go into some parts of the country today where certain belief systems are in play and you try to find employment, you might find it till somebody in that belief system is looking for a job and then you're out the door and the new person is in. So I believe that enough time had passed that these saints in Jerusalem uh, were just finding it difficult to find employment and word had probably gotten out uh, as to what they believed. How did Paul know what would be awaiting him when he finally arrived in Jerusalem? Well, the answer is he was told. He was told what to expect. Uh, when he was 76 miles out, Caesarea is 76 miles from Jerusalem, a prophet named Agabus foretold how Paul would be... Um, he would be bound, and he would be handed over to the Gentiles if he carried out his donation plan, his journey uh, uh, to Jerusalem. In fact, his entire entourage uh, tried with, in a very emotional manner, uh, we'll see here, to persuade him to go no further. Stay right here. Don't go on into Jerusalem. Paul's answer sitting in Acts chapter 21, uh, verse 13. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? He was, he was uh, getting emotional over their emotion. For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, how many of us have that kind of commitment uh, to what we believe? But Paul was ready to give his life. They obviously loved the Apostle Paul. And they feared for him because the Holy Spirit had just reveal, revealed what Paul would be facing should he go on to Jerusalem. And Paul knew that the prophet Agabus uh, was speaking under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is the backdrop for Paul's trip to Rome in journey number four, which we'll see in a few moments. Now, we talked about Paul's time in Jerusalem in our previous message, his appearance at the Jewish Sanhedrin, his defense before uh, procurators Felix and Festus, where he made his appeal to Caesar. He said, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. He was even questioned by King Agrippa, who would have dismissed the charges against Paul, but he had already made his appeal to Caesar, so off to Rome, Paul would go, and he would go under guard, as we well know. You can read about Paul's time at sea on this fourth journey in Acts chapter 27. There you'll see how he encouraged the centurion uh, soldier there in charge of the vessel and its occupants. 276 men, uh, that would include the prisoners, made that journey. Uh, and we know that no man on board would lose his life. Paul told them that. He had to tell them when to eat, by the way, because they had fasted for so many days. And he says, stop, eat some meat here. You're, you know, you're going to perish. So no man would lose his life in the massive storm that they encountered on that journey. However, 
while no life would be lost, the ship would indeed be lost, as Paul foretold. And, and it ended up just as Paul said, an angel of God had revealed to him that it would. Uh, the ship began to break up. But while trying to keep the ship intact as long as they could, they discovered a, 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 a creek with a shoreline. And it was there that they grounded their vessel. And uh, it began breaking apart. As it began breaking apart, they abandoned ship and they made their way to shore. Some were holding on to boards, we're told. Others were holding on to pieces of the boat or the vessel. Uh, but all of them made it safely to land. The island they were on was the island of Melite. Who can tell me what the name of it is today? Malta, the island of Malta, sure. Beautiful place to visit if you've not been there. And uh, gracious, very gracious people there. Uh, they would love you when you go. But um, welcoming people. They were as welcoming in Paul's day as they are in ours. And Malta, as some of you will recall, is where Paul shook off that poisonous snake that latched onto his hand. Uh, was latched on because the fangs were into his hand. Um, but the Lord was not through with the Apostle Paul. Uh, so what happened? Nothing. Had Paul died from that venomous snake bite, we wouldn't have his final seven letters, Ephesians through uh, 2 Timothy. We would have none of that. So nothing happened to Paul. When those from the island who... Uh, who had gone out to greet the newcomers, saw that Paul suffered no ill effects. He didn't just die from that snake bite. Um, they knew he wasn't a goner, so they thought he was a god. So they began worshiping him as a god, and he had to straighten them out. Paul had to, to, to fix their mindsets there. Now, we don't know how much Paul taught, um, was able to teach those folks in Malta, but Scripture tells us that the men from the ship remained on that island of Malta for three months. So uh, the people were being were being healed of their various diseases the whole time Paul was there. And they were honoring Paul and those along with him. And the islanders supplied Paul and all those of the ship with everything they could possibly need while they were there. And they also supplied everything they would need for their journey on to Rome because they knew where they were headed. Uh, we can be certain that Paul taught them plenty over a three months' stay as news of the risen, ascended Messiah who had promised to return to the earth and, and what he had accomplished at Calvary where the sins of mankind are concerned was spreading rapidly throughout the known world. How would you like to have three months sitting at the feet of the Apostle Paul? And I know we'll have more than that time uh, sitting at the feet of our Savior, but sitting at the feet of the Apostle Paul right here now prior to the catching away of the body of Christ. Wouldn't it be neat to sit there and question him? How many questions I would have. Uh, I'd load him down with questions and uh, try to pick his brain, but um, there'd be a lot of questions fired his way. After their sojourn in Malta, the crew, along with the uh, prisoners, including Paul, would make their way on to Rome, where Paul was handed over to the captain of the guard, the Bible tells us. I'm giving you the short history before we get into the book. And after which, Paul made his case to the chief of the Jews in that area. Scripture tells us that some believed and some did not. Would, we, would that be any different today? I think today we might say the vast majority didn't believe. A very tiny few did. Uh, but that was the case in Paul's day. Paul wasn't thrown into prison in Rome. Now we often call these next epistles, at least the next four, his prison epistles. But uh, probably a, a better name would have been his house epistles arrest epistles because he was never thrown into prison although he was a prisoner in his own house and he was put there with a single guard one man to watch him and people were allowed to come in people were allowed to go out there was no uh, seclusion of Paul in that manner and this would be the case for the next two years for our apostle it was during this two-year period under house arrest that Paul wrote at least four of his remaining seven letters uh, that would be Ephesians Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, at least four. This is why these four letters are, are often called, as, as I've said, his prison epistles. Um, house confinement letters, we might say. First letter he wrote from Rome. Anyone have an idea? The very first one he would write from Rome. It's the very next letter. Uh, when we get through the, the sequence, as he wrote them time-wise, as he wrote his letters, the last letter he wrote was Romans. And then the letter that came next would be his letter from house arrest. And that letter would be the letter we've come to now in our journey through the Bible. As you look back over the handbook titles that I've given Paul's epistles, you can see uh, that I've called his letter to the Ephesians, which is the next letter Paul wrote after Romans, Paul's handbook on unity. Paul's handbook on unity. Some might call it, and really appropriately, unity through union. 
is the, is the better title. But to give it one title, I've called it unity. Uh, this was a special kind of unity, as I said. This was a unity based on union. So it's only fitting that Paul should talk about unity being the bond of peace in the letter that comes right after the letter Romans. Uh, agape is the bond of spiritual maturity, Paul tells, uh, tells us, and we've, we've seen that. Um, so agape and unity go hand in hand where believers of the gospel of Christ are concerned. You can't have one without the other. Agape and unity go, uh, unity go hand in hand. Where you don't have the practice of agape, you don't have unity. Agape and unity are intricately tied together when it comes to the household of faith. Paul's telling us that here. Where you see the bond of peace, where believers are concerned, you know that agape is being practiced properly. Uh, it's as simple as that. Where there is no peace among the believers in the household of faith, agape is not being properly practiced. Consider Paul's letter with me for just a moment here. You know the epistle where Paul used the word translated love or agape? He actually used the word agape more often than any other letter he wrote, uh, save one. What letter would you guess that would be? The most occurrences of the word agape save one epistle. It's the book we just finished examining. It's the book of Romans where Paul mentioned agape love 17 times. Now, if we want to combine some epistles, First and Second Corinthians come in at a close second with 16 and 13 mentions of agape, uh, respectively, but no other epistle from Paul comes anywhere close to Romans, save for First and Second Corinthians put together, and one that blows them all away. Uh, even Romans, when it comes to Paul's use of the word agape. Um, all the rest have somewhere between three and seven mentions. The book of Romans is next to, the, next to the top again with 17 mentions of agape. But as I've said, one of Paul's letters even eclipses the book of Romans when it comes to agape. That letter comes in at a whopping 20 mentions. Can anybody tell me what it is? His very next epistle. Romans the most and then Ephesians more than that. Those two letters, Romans and Ephesians, the topic, the topic is agape uh, as we're going to see. Romans, Paul's handbook on faith, and Ephesians, his handbook on unity, are where we see Paul talk about agape most often. Faith, with its resultant agape love, and unity, with its resultant peace, are what these epistles are all about. So you know, kind of going in, where we're going with Ephesians. Paul's handbook on faith, and Ephesians, his handbook on unity, Agape. It's, they're filled with agape. Think of it this way. Faith and unity go hand in hand. And the result is love and peace. Uh, when we see that unity doctrine, faith doctrine in operation is love. You see it at the top there. That was Romans. Unity doctrine operating properly brings peace. Faith, love, unity, peace. That's the order in which Paul presents these four issues in these two epistles, Romans and Ephesians. Let me quick, quickly show you what I'm talking about here. Think back to Romans for just a moment. Do any of you recall Paul's words in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, the text of our previous message as we concluded our look at Romans? Here it is once again, just to refresh our memories, Romans chapter 13, verse 8. You'll know it as soon as you see it. Oh, no man, anything but to... Agape one another, for he that agape, he that loveth another, hath fulfilled the law. Now that statement is sitting in the final cornerstone of Romans. The actions based upon attitude section of Romans, we might call it. The final section of Romans. We might also call it behavior based on belief uh, as a section in Romans. It's the presentation cornerstone of Romans. So in Romans, Paul presents the great doctrines of faith and the logical outworking of that faith, which is love, agape. So there he is in Romans, faith, love. His very next letter was written to the saints in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. This would be a most important letter because in Ephesians, Paul talks about unity and peace. The products of faith and love are unity and peace. Do you see the progression if we look at the chronological order of the epistles as Paul wrote them? And the issues he wants these saints to understand is the unity aspect these folks were failing to appreciate in Ephesus. Now stay with me here for a moment and you'll see what I'm talking about. When it comes to no unity and therefore no peace between two different people groups in your Bible, 
what two people groups might I be referring to? Anyone have an idea? Someone spit it out. The Jews and the Gentiles. No peace, folks. Uh, I'm sure you know that answer. The two people groups were the Jews and the Gentiles. Not much has changed in the world, has it? Um, basically, all those who are not of Jewish heritage are Gentiles. The Bible translators used other words, such as heathen, in the place of the Gentiles. Now consider the reasons for the hostility that existed and still exists today unfortunately in many circles between these two people groups the Jews and the Gentiles so let's travel back in history and let me show you some of that hostility and how it was deeply embedded in the minds of both Jews and the Gentiles the Gentiles had given up on God we were told early on in human history they'd given up on God according to the Apostle Paul they had become too wise in their own minds to entertain such foolishness as a single most high God if that God was not a God of their own design of their own choosing if they felt the need for God why they were wise enough in their conceited manner of thinking to create that God for themselves it would be uh, God little g of course and Paul states that very thing in Romans chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 where he tells us because that when they, the word they there, the pronoun speaks of nations or Gentiles. It's the same word. When they, the Gentiles, knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Now, the, the word heart, their foolish heart, not their foolish hearts, their foolish heart was darkened. It's singular in that passage because Paul was speaking corporately there. Here we're speaking of the Gentiles as an entire group, all the nations. According to Paul, the Gentiles began worshiping the creation, the creatures above the creator. What did God do? How did he respond to that? Well, most of you know the answer. You're aware of the rest of the story. God chose one man out from among those nations, those Gentiles, and through that single man, Abram, God would form a single nation. In fact, God made a covenant with Abram to give to him and to his seed after him a land, a piece of real estate on this planet as an everlasting possession. But who had become the occupiers of that territory, of that land, long before God gave it to Abram? The answer is Gentiles. The Gentiles were already there when Abraham went to walk the length and breadth of it. Here it is in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. And Abram passed through the land unto a place of Shechem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. So he's encountering a group of people as he's, when he was just told he was given that land. Who were the Canaanites? Well, simple, they were Gentiles. The Canaanites were not Jewish, they were Gentiles. And the Canaanites were not the only Gentileites, as we might call them, uh, dwelling in the land that God gave to Abram and to Abraham's seed. There were numerous Gentile groups in that land where Abram was told to walk the length and the breadth of it because it was his. And it would be given to his seed after him. In fact, everybody was a Gentile, as I said earlier, that wasn't of the seed line of Abraham that would pass through Isaac and Jacob. The covenant that God made with Abraham was a very important covenant in that God was establishing a particular group of people to be a people unto himself, a peculiar treasure unto himself, a nation, as the Bible states it, a nation above all the Gentile groups, a nation above all Gentiles. That nation would come to known as the nation Israel. All right? Was there a physical sign way back then was there a physical sign that separated the people of Israel from the Gentiles? A physical sign that proved you were a part of the covenant people of God, separate from all the Gentile nations? I think that heads are nodding yes. Yes, there was a physical sign. You know what it was. Uh, the answer is, and you folks know again, circumcision. It was the physical sign that would separate Israel from all the nations. That sign was physical. It was circumcision. You can read all about that in Genesis chapter 17. And we won't, we won't go back and, uh, and search that out right now. But was there a way for a Gentile at that time to be numbered among the people of Israel? To convert, so to speak, to Judaism. Yes, there was. Uh, to be considered a legal part of that nation... 
The Old Testament scriptures tell us that a Gentile could be numbered with the people of Israel if that Gentile took hold of the covenant, which would of necessity require that physical separation sign, circumcision. So that Gentile would be separating himself from the nations of the earth by taking hold of the covenant and being circumcised. Um, when God handed down the law to Israel now, through Moses, circumcision was an a integral part of that law. Notice it back in Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a, if a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of that man-child's foreskin shall be circumcised. So these are some key words sitting here we need to notice up front. Unclean and separated. Unclean and separated. The word unclean was an important word uh, for, the, for the people of the nation Israel. We'll be exploring that more fully in just a few min minutes. But every male in Abraham's household was to be circumcised immediately when that decree was passed down. And every other male that was born at eight days of age. And if the, the Jews had, if someone had volunteered or willingly um, paid off debt, became in, in uh, uh, a household occupant of somebody in, Gen in Jerusalem, those Gentiles had to be circumcised for the Jews to have anything to do with them. The Jew couldn't hire a Gentile and have that Gentile as a part of his household working unless that Gentile was circumcised. Because the word clean and unclean was a huge thing when it came to the law program and the nation Israel. You couldn't be numbered with the people of God apart from circumcision. Whether they were Hebrews or whether they were purchased as slaves and were working in a Jewish household, if they were male, the Israelites were to insist upon circum circumcision lest those Israelites themselves be cut off from the people of God as they themselves would be considered unclean in the mind of the rest of the nation. You see how circumcision would be a dividing factor? A dividing point between Israelites and the Gentiles at that point in time? God put that sign of separation in place. It was a part of the law program. So when it came to circumcision or non-circumcision, clean or unclean, the law separated people groups. The law itself separated the unclean from the clean. You see, that could affect attitudes on both sides of the divided human race now, Jews and Gentiles, way back with the call of Abraham and their journey through the wilderness. We're better off than you <laughs> would be the mantra coming from one side, one group, and the other group, who do you think you are? Who makes you so and high, mighty and above us? Why do you think you alone have a God and our gods are nothing? Our God is the only God. You see the separation already being formed early on in history between the Jewish mind and the Gentile mind. Massive division. Now some might say unfair. Unfair. Why, God had created this division in the first place. He created this division in the human race to begin with when he called out Abraham and established circumcision and handed down the law. So isn't God to blame for this division of mind? This was his idea, some are apt to say. But lest we all forget, it had been the Gentiles who had wanted nothing to do with God before that, not the other way around. It wasn't the God that didn't want anything to do with the Gentiles. It was the Gentiles that didn't want a thing to do with God. They didn't want to keep him in their minds. They wanted to declare themselves to be atheist uh, without God. So a Gentile at that point in time could have willingly taken hold of the covenant and could have chosen to be circumcised. In other words, a Gentile could convert to Judaism He'd have to give up his Gentile status and take up the status of Judaism. Um, but I think you can see how the pride of life would affect the attitudes of the Jewish people toward the Gentiles back then. And vice versa. The Gentiles were equally as antagonistic in their own pride nature when it came to their attitude against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and against the people of the nation Israel. So you've got Heads batting against heads here. And these are deeply ingrained things, and naturally it would be deeply ingrained in the children, wouldn't it? Of the parents at that time. When Samson, and then David called the, the Philistines uncircumcised, that wasn't a mere medical description. He wasn't saying, well, that's just a medical description here for those people. No, that was an ethnic insult. That was a, a poisonous or pointed poisonous slur when he said those uncircumcised. They were unclean. 
And throughout the Old Testament scriptures, the storyline is that the physically uncircumcised, the unclean Gentiles, were the enemies of God. Now follow the story. You know where the separation, the division came in the minds of man. Unclean enemies of God. In fact, the prophets used terms for the uncircumcised, such uh, for the Gentiles, and heathen was used, barbarian was used. You see the different, different words. It's not difficult to understand how there was no love loss between these two people groups, and it just got worse and worse as time progressed. Obviously, there was little peace between them, unless one side thought they had something to gain, something of value to gain from the other, and a treaty might be signed, a truce might be declared. The pride of life working against the law of circumcision itself had resulted in an enormous amount of enmity, as we would call it, estrangement between the two major people groups of mankind, Jews and everyone else, Jews and Gentiles. Think back. Who had kept the Jewish people captive in Egypt to begin with? Was it other Jews? No. <laughs> It was Gentiles. It was the Gentiles. And carry it forward. Who was continually confronting Israel, trying to hinder Israel's journey to the land God had given them as they made their way through these Gentile territories? Who was continually confronting the, the Jews and trying to hold them back, deter their journey? Well, it was Gentiles. So you see how the attitudes are becoming more and more deeply ingrained in the people? Now think back to Israel's entrance into their promised land for a moment. Now they're entering that land under Joshua. God said, be strong, be courageous. I'm here, I'm with you. Be strong, be courageous. Two great words. When the Jewish people entered the land, God had given to them in his foreknowledge, uh, in his foreknowledge of the mindsets of the Gentiles as having been firmly set against him, he told the Israelites to take no captives of the Gentile men. He knew what was in the minds of the Gentiles. He knew what would be coming down the road from those Gentiles if they left anyone alive. So he said, take no captives uh, of, of the Gentile men. Slay the men. Spare the women. Spare the children. And spare the cattle. But when it comes to the men, slay every man there. Do you remember that in your Bible? If you wanted a, a note, you could go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 20. People say, wow, this is a barbaric God. Who would want to believe in the God of the Bible? He's telling them to slay every male alive. But God knew what was in the minds of those Gentile nations. And he knew where those Gentile nations would lead the people of his nation honoring him. God has foreknowledge. You can find that story, by the way, in Deuteronomy chapter 20. They weren't to marry the Gentiles. They weren't to mingle with the Gentiles. They were to smite and utterly destroy them, Deuteronomy 7.2. You see, God knew how the unbelieving nations, or Gentiles, the rejectors of the Most High God at that time, would influence the Israelite people once they entered their land. In some cases, the Israelites were to allow nothing that breathed to remain alive. Listen to the, to the instructions that God told Samuel to relate to Saul concerning the Amalekites in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. This is not a pretty passage, folks. But keep in mind, it was the Amalekites as Israel was traveling through the wilderness. It was the Amalekites that encountered the Israelites and held them back, laid in wait and struck them uh, as they were coming through. Listen to what God's telling Samuel to tell Saul. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Listen up, Saul. God's speaking to you through me, and this is what God is saying to you, Saul. Listen carefully. Do exactly as God tells you, Saul. That's the idea here. Now watch what Saul was to do in, in verses 2 and 3 of 1 Samuel 15. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how that he laid wait for him in the way. Now we have memories, and mine especially is not so good at some times. But God has a memory. And he had a memory of what happened to Israel when they encountered the, Amalek, the Amalekites. How he, they laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. Now this is a really unpleasant part. Slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep camel and ass. In other words, if it breathes, kill it. 
Don't let anything remain alive. Now, how could God do that? Did God not know with his foreknowledge what was in their minds? Did he not know what those children, what the infant, what the suckling, would he not know how their mindsets as they grew up, knowing their mindsets in advance, would affect the people of his nation and what they would be doing? Slay everything that's drawing breath, Saul. Now, don't immediately jump to the idea that that, that comes from a mean-spirited, unfair God. That's what many are want to do, as I said, as they go back and say, I can't believe the God of the Bible because look at this. And they use that, some folks, as their excuse to reject the Most High God. But you've got to think a little more deeply than that. Did God, in his foreknowledge, knowledge, know the unchanging mind of the Amalekites? And how steadfastly they would remain and their children in unbelief and rejection of him. Most certainly he knew that. But he knew more than that. God had also known how their unchanging minds and their rejection of him would affect, I should say infect, the minds of his people. The people of his nation Israel. God had known that the Malachites would lead the people of Israel into the worship of false gods. Little g. Idol worship. And how the Israelites, the Israelites would end up, and they did indeed end up doing that very thing God knew would happen. They ended up sacrificing their own children to the idols. These Gentile nations had been serving, such as Baal and Molech, and you know how they did that. Molech was a big stone god with his arms out like this, and they would get that stone god red hot and lay their infants in the arms of that stone god and sacrifice their children. Did God know about that ahead of time? You bet he did. Kill it if it lives. Saul, don't let anything breathe that's in there. Did Saul obey orders? Nope. He didn't. And we have Israelites down the road sacrificing their children to, Amalek, or to, the, uh, to the god Molech and to Baal. The Israelites had to fight against the Gentiles while on their way to the land. They had to fight against the opposing Gentile groups that, once they were in the land. And then the Israelites ended up um, ended up turning to the ways being practiced by these God-rejecting, out-of-worshipping Gentile groups. And it began with a mindset, Jews against Gentiles, way back when the law established a difference between clean and unclean, circumcised and the uncircumcised group. When they were finally cast out of their promised land, and those who have been through the series know there was a fifth bucket of wrath God promised would come upon the nation, who swore they could keep his law, Keep it faithfully, keep it consistently, and when they didn't, these buckets would fall in succession, and the fifth bucket did indeed fall. Israel was cast out of their land, spewn out of the land. And they were taken captivity by, by whom? Gentiles. Gentiles. It's not difficult to see the deeply rooted animosity residing in the minds of Jews and Gentiles for one another, antagonistic attitudes that became more and more firmly entrenched as time went on and had begun with circumcision, the division in the human race that was in the law contract. The Gentile nations uh, opposed God and they opposed God's people and they opposed, uh, they opposed everything that had to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The greatest enmity in scripture is of course the enmity that exists I believe in Satan's mind for the Most High God. But aside from that, I, I think we'd all be hard-pressed to find any greater degree of enmity than that which existed and still exists, as I said earlier, unfortunately, in many circles, between Jews and Gentiles. There was no greater enmity in the world. Think back to the law program for a moment. The word unclean is used 110 times in the book of Leviticus alone in connection with the law of Moses. The refusal to be circumcised caused a person to be legally, lawfully unclean. We read that a moment ago. Ceremonial cleanliness was a huge part of the Israelites' religious life, which required all those ceremonial washings called baptisms in Scripture for Israel because that would restore a cleanness from an unclean position or status. The law of Moses provided the prescription, and in some issues, there was none. To, to restore a Jewish person who had become unclean, according to the law of Moses, back to a condition of cleanness. What then did that make the Gentiles, who had never been given the law of Moses in the first place, nor any prescription for uncleanness in connection with the law they'd never been given? 
Why it made the Gentiles unclean. As far as the Jewish people were concerned, they were unclean. Do you see why they were not to have anything to do with the Gentiles? Not to mingle with them? Not to have conversation with them? Oh, they could if it was commerce related, but only for the commerce. Those who were uncircumcised were unclean. The law of Moses made that very clear. Can you see the antagonistic attitudes again on both sides of the aisle that would have been prevalent in that day? The Gentiles didn't want any part of God or of circumcision. The latter part we can probably better understand. But the Jews, on the other hand, considered the Gentiles to be godless barbarians, pagans, unclean heathen, according to the words used in your Bible. Now, fast forward. Fast forward in your mind to the days of Jesus Christ and his ministry. As a Jew under law, Israel's promised Messiah no less, to the Jews who had been placed under the law of Moses. How about the disciples in Matthew chapter 15 to whom Christ spoke um, when the Canaanite woman asked him to cast a demon out of her daughter? What was in the mind of the 12 apostles when, where Gentiles in general were concerned? We've already seen, haven't we? Now what was in their minds when this Gentile woman asked Christ to cast a demon out of her daughter? That Syrophoenician woman was, after all, a Gentile. How did Christ respond to her request? Listen to his words in Matthew chapter 15, verse 23. These are words you're familiar with, most of you. Well-known passage, as I said. Matthew 15, 23 through 24. But he, Christ, answered her not a word. He didn't look at her, we're told by many scholars. They would know, but the intimation here uh, is that he didn't look at her. And his disciples came and they talked to him. They, were pleading. they besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered his disciples and said, for I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Of course, Christ went on to grant a request once she acknowledged her position, her status, under God's favored nation. But notice the Lord's response to his disciples when this Gentile woman made her appeal. Here it is in verse 26. But Christ answered and said, it's not me, not appropriate, it's not a fitting thing to do. To take the children's bread, who are the children? The children of Israel. To take the children's bread and cast it to the, next word, dogs. Was there an attitude? Was it a legal attitude? You see, Christ's crucifixion hadn't taken place at this point. And his reply was in direct keeping with his command he had just given the twelve in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go, next word, not, go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans, Jews who had married non-Jews were the Samarians. It was a, a mixed marriage group there. Enter ye not to those people, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Gentiles were, what's the word, begins with the letter U. Unclean. <laughs> They were God-rejecting, unclean people, according to the law of Moses. Christ-rejecting, heathen was the word chosen by the Bible translators. Do you think the twelve had a problem with avoiding the Gentiles, doing as Christ said, and avoiding the Gentiles at that time? Do you think they were saying, oh, we wish we could go to the Gentiles? Or do you think they were so thankful, so grateful, they didn't have to come anywhere near a Gentile at that point in time? you think they had a problem realizing their superior position relative to the unclean Gentiles when Christ used the word translated dog in Matthew chapter 15. Would that have given them pause or would they have said, Amen, preach it, <laughs> preach it. They didn't mind that at all because they had known the rift that had always existed between Jews and Gentiles. It came with the unclean status appointed to them according to the law of Moses. The word translated dog, by the way, literally means hound, and I don't know if there's any negativity with that. People who own hounds for hunting dogs would say, no, that's a good thing. Uh, but it's literally hound, so it was a physical dog. The disciples were telling Christ to get rid of those Gentiles. Send that Gentile, send her away. The attitude in their minds, she's annoying us. She's really getting on our last nerve. Get her out of her sight. She might actually touch one of us. You see the attitude there? And there isn't any question that they heard Christ reply when he used the word dog right after that, when referring to her Gentile status. That hadn't been anything new to the twelve. Peace had been a word reserved for treaties. Peace had been a, a word reserved for truce, a word used for commerce when commerce was absolutely necessary, not a word for tenderness. Um, 
Peace was a word for contract, not a word for connection when it came to the Jews and the Gentiles of that day. But you see, Christ's crucifixion had not yet occurred. It had yet to take place. The time was close at hand for his crucifixion, but that had not yet happened. It was only after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ that he told the twelve to now go into all the world. Go into the entire world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that gospel would have been the gospel of God, meaning the identity, deity, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing about the cross. Just that he was the promised Messiah and that God had made him Lord. He's now the judge of the living and the dead and he's arisen from the dead. That's all they knew. That was the only message that Paul was told on the road to Damascus. The good news of what a Christ had accomplished at Calvary through his death, burial, and resurrection, that's the gospel of Christ and that wouldn't be revealed until the ascended Lord of glory commissioned the apostle Paul to go and proclaim it and to make all men see what came about as a result of the cross of Christ. When we see what Christ accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection, where the sins of the world are concerned, that he actually put those sins away, taking them off the table of God's justice, we come to understand a love called agape that goes far beyond the concept of love from the perspective of the world and sadly from the perspective of believers in many cases. You might recall Peter at the house of the Gentile man named Cornelius. How many can, might go back there? Although this would have come after the stoning of Stephen, Peter had obviously not heard anything at all about the mystery, the secret purpose of God at that time. The only thing Peter would have known about Paul at that time was that Paul was now teaching the gospel that Peter and the twelve had been preaching, the gospel of God. Jesus is the Christ, Israel's promised Messiah. God's made him Lord. And he's risen from the dead. That was the gospel again Paul called Saul at the time had silently rejected in his earlier life. In fact, he'd been persecuting some to the point of, of death. Anyone who happened to believe that gospel of God. So what did Peter say to the entire group after the angel of the Lord went, uh, sent him to this Gentile man's house named Cornelius? Peter said, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation why? They were unclean. They were unclean. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Acts 10.28. I like it how, and it was Frank put it earlier, the table was being set for Peter. Peter was beginning to see, whoa. Now did Peter know what the cross had accomplished at that point? No. But he did know that God was no respecter of persons. Why now? He can't call those Gentiles unclean any longer. He's going to find out why he couldn't call them unclean any longer down the road. But God had already shown Peter the vision of the sheet that came down with all manner of four-footed unclean animals on it. Remember that story in your Bible? And then told Peter to arise and eat. Peter couldn't eat. Those were unclean animals. And what did God say? Don't call unclean that which I've already cleansed. So that was setting the stage for Peter to know something's changed here in the attitude of God Almighty. God was no longer considering Gentiles to be unclean. And that was a stark revelation to the man named Peter. Some might ask, was that the revelation, the mystery that Paul was sent to proclaim? The answer is no. <laughs> no. The mystery hidden from ages and generations until it was given to the Apostle Paul to make known to all men was that God had intended to do something and he intended this before the foundation of the world to do with Jews, the clean and the unclean that were now not called unclean anymore that believed the gospel of Christ that was coming up. The fact that God had a plan to save Gentiles had never been a secret. You can read about that in the, in the prophets. The Gentiles would be saved? No mystery, no secret. The prophets have foretold that. Of course, the prophets had foretold how the Gentiles would come to God through Israel's rise. But here they are now coming to God through Israel's fall. That hadn't been foretold. This is why the Apostle Paul called the mystery or the secret revealed first to him the hidden wisdom of God. Because there's more involved with what God's going to do that's relate, related to this mystery. It was the mystery of God's will, the Bible calls it, his eternal purpose, where those who have taken him at his word are concerned, that God had been keeping secret. And this mystery is what God had always intended to do where his household of faith is concerned. And this is where the word unity 
comes into play and why unity through union is the most important reality to understand for believers today and why it was so important for Paul to, to proclaim, portray this to the Jews and Gentiles of his day whose mindset was this, no peace. You see, the animosity or enmity existing between Jews and Gentiles from the time of the separation God established between members of the human race with a physical requirement of circumcision, the law of Moses, would not be something easy to overcome for the Jews and Gentiles of that day. However, God removed all the cause for that enmity between Jew and Gentile. All cause for enmity between Jews and Gentiles, and he did that through the cross work of his son, and Paul's going to explain that in this book of Ephesians. Because faith leading to agape should bring the understanding of union through the mystery to the reality of peace. And that's where Paul's taking us. There isn't any room for enmity between Jew and Gentiles in the household of faith, according to the Apostle Paul. That issue, Christ's cross work, has resolved once and for all. And this is what Paul explains in his letter to the saints at Ephesus. Just to quickly recap once again, faith doctrine and the call to agape love came in Romans. You can see it there. Unity based on union doctrine and the peace that God made possible as a result of that union are Paul's two major topics in the book of, of Ephesians, the very next epistle chronologically. Can you see the flow can you see the flow from Romans to Ephesians here? The progression from one epistle right to the very next epistle? Let's take a quick look now at what God did to bring this peace about between Jews and Gentiles. Paul opened this Ephesians letter with his usual greeting of grace and what follows grace? Peace. You know, it's in all of his epistles, grace and peace to you. Uh, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he then proceeds to tell these saints how they had been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in their union with Christ. He commends them for their faith and love toward all the saints. And then Paul reveals the direction of his audience in chapter 2. Who's he writing to here? Beginning uh, with verse 10. The direction of this letter was the Gentiles. And the backdrop was, backdrop was all that antagonism that had existed between the Gentiles and the Jews of that day. And so he's addressing his letter to the Gentiles. Paul wanted these Gentile believers to understand the magnitude of what Christ had accomplished for them at Calvary through an understanding of the mystery or the secret purpose that God had in mind for all believers and his son before the foundation of the world. Uniting all believers to his son had always been God's purpose, his eternal purpose. He just hadn't made it known until the Apostle Paul was sent to proclaim it to all men, and that would include Jews and Gentiles alike. I'm going to unite all believing mankind through all the ages. I'm going to unite them to the very person of my son. That's union. Do you see why Paul could say grace and peace to you believers in every epistle he wrote? Grace and peace, grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I guess so. Does God know about the union that exists between believers and his son? You bet he does. He established it. It was his intent, his eternal purpose. It was the purpose of his will. And now he's telling Paul, make it known to everyone, Paul. Don't exclude Peter, James, and John. Don't exclude those people. Make the fellowship, the koinonia, the oneness of the mystery known to how many people? Make it known to everybody, Paul. And he, he most certainly did that. It's the core. It's the core. Paul boiled the law down to one word. Who can tell me what that word was? Remember? It's agape. It was the word agape. You know, Christ boiled it down to, well, it's boiled down to the Ten Commandments and down to the two statements, love the Lord your God, love, you love your neighbor as yourself. And then Paul narrows that down further and just calls it agape. Love. Love fulfills the law. So love. He boiled down that law to one word, and that word was agape. Love worketh no ill to his neighbors. Therefore, love. Agape is the fulfilling of the law. If we had to boil the mystery down to a single concept... A single reality where all believers are concerned. That reality is union-related unity. That's three words, but union-related unity. You see, it will only be through an understanding of our union with Christ, and therefore our union with fellow believers, which is the core of the mystery, that peace could ever be realized between believers, whether in Paul's day or in ours. So Paul's explaining it right there in Ephesians. We saw the separation that God established 
in the human race, a separation between Jews and Gentiles, with the call of Abram and the physical sign of the covenant called circumcision, the law itself created that division in humankind by establishing what was clean and what was unclean. And only the Israelites had the ceremonial washings again, or the baptisms, um, which were God's ordained method, uh, or prescription we might call it, for cleansing. Those baptisms themselves were a part of the law program, the law of Moses. So follow it through. The only way to do away with the enmity between Jews and Gentiles was to first do away with the clean and unclean designations in humanity. God had to erase the difference between clean and unclean. Now watch God remove that enmity through the cross work of his son. Here it is in Ephesians chapter 2. I know we've covered these things in the past, but here we are in the book of Ephesians. And since Paul presents it, the heartbeat of the mystery, right here in this letter, we must re-examine it once again. I'll start reading with verse 11. Wherefore, what do, you remember, what do you Gentiles have in your mind? You remember the enmity, don't you Gentiles? In time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh, who are called what? You are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. There's that division. Why the Jews called you unclean in the past. You were called the uncircumcision. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You had to have your status changed if you wanted anything to do with God. But the great hinge verse and the great hinge words as the door is opening from one thing to another thing sits right here in Ephesians chapter 2. But now, something has changed. Oh, you didn't have anything to do with them in the time past because you were unclean. You were the uncircumcision. But now, in Christ Jesus... Ye who sometimes, or for a time, were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Christ's shed blood was the sacrifice necessary to not only redeem the Israelites from the curse of the law, but to also redeem the entire unclean human race from what that curse would accomplish for the entire human race, which would include Gentiles. <laughs> the eternal counsel of the Godhead had planned before the foundation of the world to have the law's requirements perfectly satisfied through the sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus Christ, his faithfulness, thereby eliminating the enmity in the human race. Do you see what happened at Calvary? That which had resulted in no peace between Jews and Gentiles, namely division between the clean and the unclean, written into the law of Moses, was no longer a division issue. Notice it here in verses 14 and 15. For he, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who hath made both, both who? Both whom? Jews and Gentiles, who had made both Jews and Gentiles one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in Christ's flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. For to make in himself of the two, Jews and Gentiles, one new man so making peace. That one new man would come through the union established in the household of faith between the believer and Christ himself. And if I'm joined to Christ, united to Christ, so that we are one, so that what belongs to him belongs to me, and a Jew comes along and that Jew believes in what Christ accomplished for him at Calvary as well as me, and there is no unclean, clean status anymore, because God can recognize the Gentiles today and wants to recognize the Gentiles today as he always wanted the Jews to take his word to the Gentiles. And that Jew is made a member of Christ's body of his flesh and of his bones, one with Jesus Christ. Then that makes the Jews and the Gentiles one. That makes them one. The mystery, the heartbeat of the mystery was the union that God had always intended to establish between his household of faith and the person of the Savior, making them one with their Savior. And if I'm one with my Savior and you're one with my Savior, then what are we sitting right here today? We're one. So that's the bridge, folks. That's the bridge between, there is a bridge between love, agape, and peace. And Christ had to span that bridge for us, and he did. Now, we have to span that bridge between one another if we're to realize that the peace that agape is to bring us to.
Notice it here in Ephesians 2.16. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentiles unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, the Gentiles, and to them which were nigh, the Jews. Amazing thing. And if that weren't enough, again, this one flesh relationship between the believer and the Son of God, that same one flesh relationship would be true of believers with other believers, even with the believer you happen to like the least. You're as joined to the believer you like the least as you are to Christ himself. And if there's peace that Christ can give you because he spanned that bridge between love and peace, what can we do with one another? And there is a bridge, and I want to take you to that bridge. Let me put two verses back to back. From Romans and Ephesians, they follow in sequence. Here's Romans 11, or 13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. You see the move from love to peace? Now the same order appears in Ephesians, the very next book. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein with you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. There's love. Ephesians 4, 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, love, peace, love, peace. That's the order. Where there is no appropriation and appreciation of the doctrines of faith, love is not operating appropriately. Likewise, where, where there is no appreciation of the unity that comes by way of God's established union between the believer and his son, where can peace be found? What's left? The answer is only ego competing against ego. And I've got to tell you, there's a lot of egos on the throne inside and out of the professing church in our day. Uh, egos attacking egos and where self is sitting on the throne of each person's life and demanding that it be recognized, appreciated, and applauded. Isn't it amazing? Now I told you earlier there was a bridge that must be crossed when it comes to the exercise of love and the establishment of peace. I want to take my few remaining moments to show you that bridge. Paul takes us to that bridge both in Romans and in Ephesians. Isn't that interesting? Because love doesn't automatically result in peace. Did you know that? Love will not automatically result in peace unless that span is bridged. Christ bridged that span, and we know how he bridged that span. Notice it here in Romans 5.8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Now, love is a wonderful thing. But love cannot bridge the gap to peace apart from the word forgiveness. That's why we see forgiveness highlighted in Romans and Ephesians. Because forgiveness from man's part is what establishes the link between the agape that person is, is exercising and the peace that should come as a result. Without forgiveness, you have no peace. If we had not been forgiven at the cross of Christ, when God reconciled the entire world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto us, if we had not been forgiven by the cross of Christ and at the cross of Christ, if the household of faith could not have been forgiven, Paul could not have written grace to you and, next word, Peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace had to come from our forgiveness as God's love brought his forgiveness that resulted in peace. If we're going to have peace one with another today, what must we exercise, folks? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. If we don't, we'll never have our agape resulting in peace. Paul made it clear. <laughs> Wonderful news. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for in, to make in, in himself of the two of them, the one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, Gentiles, and to them that were nigh. Wow. Where is the forgiveness mentioned? Well, here it is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <laughs> verses 19. Do I have it on here? I guess I don't, but I'll read it to you. 
reconciling to wit God was in Christ, or through the, by way of his son Jesus Christ, reconciling the entire world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's committed unto us that word of reconciliation. For he, God the Father, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin in our place. Christ who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness belonging to God himself in our union with the Savior. And how shall they preach, Paul said in Romans 10, 15, except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of, next word, peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. Ephesians 6, 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul was preaching the forgiveness of sins, folks. That's what Paul was preaching. That's what he was telling the Jewish non-believers in Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through his becoming sin on your behalf and dying for those sins in your place, suffering the wrath of God you deserved upon himself, is preached unto you what? The forgiveness of sins. To how many people? To everybody. Why the need for forgiveness for something God is no longer imputing to the entire human race? That's called reconciliation. God's sure of it in his mind. He knows it's true in his mind. Whose mind does he want to be reconciled to what's true in his mind? Yours. The world's. He wants the world to understand God's not counting their sins against him. He counted them against his son. And he's not going to collect a debt twice. He's not going to collect it twice. What are we left to do? Be ambassadors of that wondrous message to take to the world. But if there's no peace within the household of faith... How can we preach peace to those outside who have yet to, to come to faith? You see it? We have to have the peace operating and the forgiveness in place so that we can take this message out to others that they might want the peace that we now enjoy with one another. Thank you, folks, for coming. Let's close it there for today. We'll pick it up next week as we continue. One more, maybe one more message in the book of Ephesians, maybe two. Who knows? It's taken us... What, two years to get where we are right now on our journey through the Bible. I'm enjoying it. I hope you do too.